Media, laws, and lies. Will Israel's crisis be America's future, or is it even America's present? I'm Matt Robeson. This is a breaking news edition of Beyond Politics. We're on the Blue Amp channel on YouTube. We're available wherever you get your podcasts. I'm really privileged to have Dan Perry, who's the former AP Mideast editor, and coming to us from there on the ground in Israel as protests rock the nation. We really wanted to cover what's going on, why, and what lessons there are and parallels to draw for the U.S. Dan, welcome to Beyond Politics. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. So you have a Substack that is must read um, that I, I think people really should be following right now. And you just wrote last night that this is, you're in the middle of this in a very real way. So just describe the scene there. What is going on and what's the context here for people who haven't been following this closely? Well, Substack described my own experience as I was at a pub with a friend and outside riots were emerging because of the latest notch in the narrative of the Israeli authoritarian coup, essentially. So as, we, as I left the pub, it was impossible to get a taxi and I walked home a couple of miles. Uh, and I was essentially inside the demonstration as people were streaming onto the main highway leading north into Jerusalem, blocking it, more or less with the assistance of police. And the blockage of that highway lasted most of the night. I think it was wow. about nine hours. And just, right just remind us all quickly, what are people protesting? Well, what are they up in arms literally about? There's a lot of tension in Israel always between the left and the center left and something, some version of the religious right over religion in the state and also over the Palestinian issue. But right now, a third matter has entered the scene, which is not unlike the battle between Trumpists and their rivals in the U.S. It really is about worldviews. It's a complete and total cultural war. And as one reflection of the cultural war, when Netanyahu finally won an election after four more or less tied elections last November, he set up a, an extreme right government that is currently trying to dismantle the edifice of liberal democracy. Now, this is super interesting because it essentially is providing a civics lesson to the entire world. A certain liberal democratic system was put into place roughly after World War II all over the world. People aren't fully aware of what it means. If you ask most people, certainly any country I've ever covered, and I was also at some point in charge of Europe and Africa for AP and in the Caribbean, wherever you go and you talk to people, you say, what is democracy? You're generally going to hear free elections and majority rule. They tend to forget oftentimes about guaranteed rights for all citizens, about protection of the minority, about checks and balances, about separation of the branches of government. Those niceties are the essence without which a government can decide that anyone named Matt can be executed tomorrow and there's no protection, okay? That would be, a, at worst, an even proposition, knowing my own demographic, but- Some might approve, but here's yeah, the thing. Yeah, some might, but that's, government... but that's a critical point though, because people often forget that it's a tripartite system in the US, it's a constitutional democracy. So we have guaranteed rights and freedoms that's just woven into the structure of what we do in the US. And also that a critical, it's a three-legged stool, and one of those legs is an independent judiciary. And you're saying that what's exploding Israel right now, even though they have a slightly different, they're a parliamentary democracy, so a slightly different- And, and no constitution. And no constitution. What's happening in Israel now is the Netanyahu government is proposing two fundamental changes to the way everything works here. One, government appoints a just, the justices and the judges, pure and simple. Right now, there's a complex judicial appointments committee that prevents- uh, the government and the judiciary and any other part of society from controlling the process. They want the politicians in power to nominate the judges, in short, puppets. They also want to eliminate almost any qualifications so they could appoint Sarah Netanyahu, who's a hairdresser, essentially, as a Supreme Court uh, justice or the chief justice. The second thing is they propose that if these would-be puppets, that they don't carry out their role as puppets uh, so with sufficient obsequiousness, then they can overrule the Supreme Court decisions. So essentially, that leaves no judicial oversight, no oversight whatsoever on the government. That, that therefore, is not a judicial reform the way it's being presented, which is a way of bamboozling the people through 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 language. It's most complicated, and people get a headache just contemplating it. Reform sounds good. You know, what institution doesn't need reforms? In fact, it's a change in the system of government that would be more accurately described as an authoritarian overhaul. If this passes, Israel becomes not unlike Russia or Turkey. Essentially, wow. it would be not unkind to call it a fake democracy. The so, government would be remarkable. able to arrest its opponents. Yeah, that's really remarkable. And we did a show 
on Beyond Politics last summer talking about Schedule F. I, I don't want to get into the weeds of that. I just commend it to people. Look it up. We had Congressman Jerry Connolly on with us talking about the Trump plan that he tried to put in place at the end of his term and has promised to put back in place if he's ever reelected to essentially do what you're describing, but to the executive branch, to basically make 50,000 people who do all the things that federal agencies do subject to political loyalty tests to Donald Absolutely. Trump, and to basically say, you want your social security benefits? You better sign a loyalty oath to Donald Trump. Now that's dangerous, and that has freaked people out in the US, but it's at least contained within the executive branch. What you're saying is that we have a separation of powers, a balance of powers that has stood us in good stead for 250 years in the U.S., and they have some uh, analog of that in Israel, and Netanyahu has proposed doing away with that separation and essentially putting the judiciary, which is the guarantor of people's rights, under his thumb. Now, there's been some commentary to the effect that the motivation here isn't just Netanyahu's overall authoritarian impulse. It's also self-protection because he is himself under legal duress. What's the deal with that? Why is he doing this? Netanyahu used to be a fierce proponent of an independent judiciary and a quality judiciary. What has changed since his, since a particularly emphatic speech along those lines is that the legal system has put him on trial for bribery, fraud, and breach of trust. And there, there had been an expectation that once he's a criminal defendant, he wouldn't continue trying to run for office. In Israel, a criminal defendant cannot be a minister in a government, nor a mayor. But through a loophole in the system, essentially, uh, you can be prime minister. But it was the kind of thing that just isn't done. Now, where all this comes together, where Israel's a vanguard in the global cultural war, is that the idea of things that are just not done because it's unbecoming and ridiculous, it's about the window. So Netanyahu was surprised a lot of people, including a lot of his supporters, by insisting on continuing to run. And he launched a very determined and eloquent assault on the police, the prosecution, uh, the judiciary, and the entire system, inventing fantasies about a deep state that is run by liberals. Now, let me tell you, among the many lies that the, the populist right in Israel is vehiculating about all this, is that the Supreme Court was some paragon of liberalism that prevented the government from carrying out the defense of the realm. And of course, that attaches to what's happening in West Bank. And I have to tell you, it is phenomenally untrue. The Israeli Supreme Court uh, certainly prevented total lunacies from happening just by virtue of its existence. And they certainly safeguarded the rights of Israelis to free speech, free assembly, freedom of everything. But as regards the Palestinians in the West Bank, it was pretty close to a rubber stamp for the occupation. It pretty much accepted the word of security services on almost any issue that came up. I mean, of, in Israel's entire history, Supreme Court interfered with laws or attempted to, criticizing some clause or item in a law. 75 years, 21 times. And of those 21 times, most were things to do with rights of individuals in Israel. Three times only was there an effort to do anything with the Palestinians. Now, I'm not saying it was meaningless. It still prevented lunacy. If this passes right now, nothing prevents lunacy. And that is their goal. Who is in favor of this? People who want total oppression of the Palestinians was back unchecked. And that will lead to another intifada. Hyper-religious Jews, the Haredim, who want their special rights enshrined into law to not serve in the army, to get special payments that no one else gets. Supreme Court is likely to interfere with those things because of, of equality under the law. And of course, criminal. We see I, that only about a quarter of the Israeli public in all the polls actually want this judiciary overhaul to continue. Everything you just said, people's heads must have been exploding thinking, wait, is he talking about Netanyahu or Trump? This is a guy who's under investigation. It was prevented. I'm talking about Trump now. Just remind me, I'm talking about that. Trump now. <laughs> this is a guy who was only not indicted because of a standing memo within the U.S. Department of Justice, not a law, just a, hey, back 40 years ago, someone wrote a memo saying, yeah, we don't think we can prosecute presidents. We're not sure, but let's just make that the policy. The only thing that was protecting Donald Trump for years. Now he himself is on the cusp of indictment. So the just to put this in context, what's happening in Israel would be as if Donald Trump as president had decided that it was time that the Supreme Court was too liberal in the US because of all their highly liberal rulings. And he had decided, I am going to 
appoint myself with the authority to kick Supreme Court justices out of office. John Roberts, you're out of here if you ever stand against me because of my personal prosecutions. There's that old quip from the 50s, if it's good for General Motors, it's good for America. Donald Trump's whole and Netanyahu's whole approach here is, if it's good for Trump, it's good for America. Well, it's good for Netanyahu, it's good for Israel. Absolutely, there are clear parallels. There are clear par parallels, both in the fact that we have here some murkiness about what is legal and what is not legal. We have the populist right basically maneuvering and gaming the system to achieve certain outcomes, like the McConnell rule. Whoever thought that would happen, that they invent the rule that, you know, about a year before an election, you can't pass the Supreme Court nomination past the Senate. But then, of course, when Ginsburg died, that's out the window. And here's the amazing parallel. The hypocrisy is mind bending and eye watering. And yet the Republicans just refused to address it. It was like the hypocrisy didn't exist. And if we want, we want to talk about it, no one will notice. And similar things are happening in Israel because this is, Matt, a cultural war between two camps that have coalesced. It's happening all over the world. I I do believe it is causing a realignment of classic politics, okay? In Israel, uh, the classic left-right division was what to do with Palestinians. The left wanted to give up the West Bank and Gaza. The right, for whatever reason, didn't. That's changing. You have a lot of former right-wingers now in the Democratic camp. And that is not unlike Mitt Romney and George W. Bush almost certainly voting for Biden. You're seeing the regular old school cuddly conservatives subtly sometimes without declaring it too loudly shifting over into something of a center and that puts the center left in a bind because of course a president like biden can't be too beholden to the progressives if he expects to win over the non-maga republicans i want to work my way around to a question to you let me give you the question up front what can we learn from israel's experience and the four do-over elections that you alluded to a moment ago that they went through, which is extraordinary, extraordinary. What can we learn from that about the possibility of centrist governing coalitions emerging in a democracy like Israel or, and you've written about this on your Substack, in a democracy like the US? And here's what I'm, now here's the kind of the workaround to that question. You were saying that traditional lines between the left and the right have gotten scrambled in Israel in recent years. Now there, they have a defining central issue that is the issue of their whole society. And look, when I was in Israel on a congressional staff delegation trip 20 years ago, they all the conversation is about the matzah. It's about the situation. It's different now, but still, it's the thing. We don't have quite the same thing in the US, but what we do have is a scrambling of some of the traditional left-right lines. Trump started the process of absolutely annihilating traditional Republican conservative positions on foreign affairs, on alliances, on NATO, on trade. Far more populist, far more almost liberal on entitlement programs like Social Security. It began to feel like, what does the Republican Party as a conservative political party stand for in America anymore? What is their policy platform? Well, and they literally gave up on it. They literally in 2020 they had no platform. Our policy, our platform, at the Republican convention was whatever Donald Trump says is good by us. And, and on the left, it, it's a similar thing because as the Democratic Party has become defined more and more by highly educated urban liberals, they're higher income folks who aren't necessarily interested in the same labor politics, the same the same economic politics, the same set of policies. That brings me back around to my question to you. You are among many who have speculated about, could the US try an experiment like they successfully for a while tried in Israel with a moderate coalitional government that represented people from the left and right could you just remind us, how did Israel end up going down that road? And why didn't it work? It didn't work because Netanyahu is such a successful politician and talented gaslighter that he was able to essentially co-opt the central part, the centrist party, what was called Kadima, and was formed by Ariel Sharon, and reestablish this coalition of the outsiders in Israel that includes the hyper-religious Jews, far-right extremists, that don't care a fig for anything to do with modernity or even prosperity, but 
just God in the West Bank, and a sort of socioeconomic lower classes that really thrive, unfortunately, all over the world on populist national nationalist messages. Wow, uh, that sounds like the Trump coalition. Go on, please. Listen, it is. But here's the thing. Those three groups together in Israel are maybe 40 percent. He still had about 10 percent that were regular conservatives, let's say Mitt Romney types, who wanted whatever they want, lower taxes. This assault on democracy in Israel is risking a loss of those people. And the remaining coalition could be a lot more like Marine Le Pen in France. Marine Le Pen, when she runs against a centrist or even a leftist in France, gets 40% of the vote. The center, the real center, the, again, the Mitt Romney types, John McCain types, the Liz Cheney types, have abandoned that version of a right. So when a right mutates from classic American conservatism to Trumpist, populist, the reactionary nationalism, they lose a lot of the center. And there is a chance there, of course, for the center left, if they know how to grab it in both countries. And polls in Israel show that the past election was a tie where about 6% of the vote on the left was wasted due to split. So Bibi gets his essentially fictitious majority in the Knesset. But it was a tie. All the polls show if the election were held today, about 10% would move to the center from the right. So he'd lose. That's why my own speculation is that whatever happens with this judicial uh, disagreement, the government won't fall because the extreme right in Israel is not going to want to return the center to power in yet another election. We shall see. But the lessons are similar in both countries, I think. Why, why does 20, 30, 40 percent, sometimes approaching 50 percent of those who actually turn out, vote for these things that most of the educated classes in both countries considered to be an abomination. How could it be? And, and there's a lot of unfortunate name calling that gets thrown around. And so why uh, do they? What's the answer to your question? Here's my answer. They're not stupid. Okay. They know they're burning down the house. They don't mind burning down the house. They don't like the house. The house did not send them to the Ivy League. The house did not give them a top 5% income. The house didn't even give them $800 to take out of the bank account in an emergency tomorrow. They don't like the house. And if it burns down, so be it. Now, it probably isn't half the people, but Trump was able to mobilize almost half the vote. And then the rest of it is, of course, America's anti-majoritarian electoral college system plus the Senate, which is even worse. It is a real tug of war between these two groups. And I strongly suggest that the centrists try to understand what it is that these people want to burn down the house. They're trying to tell us, why is that? So look, if their motivation is racism, then I can't help them there and they have to be fought. Right. But if they're saying that the system that you guys have erected post-World War II all over the world just isn't working for me, and I don't like that jobs have gone to China because that's where we're building iPhones, because, okay, rich people can buy a cheaper iPhone, but I'm unemployed. I want that coming back. I want protectionism back. That's not illegitimate. I think that needs to be listened to. I'm not advocating protectionism, but the hyper-globalization that worked out so well for the globalized elites didn't work out well for a lot of people. And I think there are ways to have a discussion with them that are not all about social justice warriors and wokeism and, and name calling on both sides. Uh, again, I don't deny that some of it <laughs> has to do with things that would offend me. Of course, there's real misogyny, there's real racism, there's real bigotry, and there's real stupidity as well. But that doesn't account for half the election. And I think that discussion will have to happen in Israel and in America, and in France, and in Britain. It's very complicated. And this is what we've been dealing with. And I think what Democrats have been grappling with, and people who focus on the mechanics of politics, the way we communicate, this is what we've been dealing with in recent years, as we've watched Trump assemble a coalition, while well, we're on the 20th anniversary of the invasion of Iraq. We can call it a coalition of the willing, whatever that is in the U.S., a coalition of the MAGA, you know. Who are... I think it's a coalition of the unwilling. That's right. It's, it it's, a, it's this motley crew. Now, Hillary Clinton was wrong. And I think you've just illustrated in very clear terms why Hillary Clinton was wrong to call these Americans a basket of deplorables, because it's mixing lots of different folks Look, if you're and, and it backfired spectacularly, and you know, and justly because if you're mixing people who are deplorable because you're a racist and that's and you're proud of it, okay, that is deplorable. I deplore that. 
On the other hand, there is a whole segment of people who feel frustration, anger, disconnection, and that they're looked down upon by cultural elites who don't understand what the hell they're going through and have absolutely no idea what they're talking about when it comes to their ideas to help them. That's a th There's a fundamental cleavage there that I can understand. What I think is really challenging, though, is that in the U.S., you have these, in Israel, it's one issue that you can really play politics on. You can essentially call people weak on the terrorism issue, which Netanyahu has done very effectively in his career. 16 out of the last 25 years, he's been prime minister and he keeps coming back to play that, that card. In the US, there's a more diffuse set of signals that it seems like Republicans are just much, much better at. They don't have to explain this whole thing of rats, they don't get you your situation and the outsourcing that's killed your economic life. They just say they want to teach your kids critical race theory and to hate America. They just say these guys, these Black Lives Matter looters are in favor of defunding the police because they're in favor of criminals. They just say oh, they want to let immigrants that backfired defunding the police. And so it comes down to I see the parallel you're drawing. I wonder, though, is there really a practical communications communicator? You're a writer. Uh, you're a journalist. Is there a communication I'm solution? I'm a partner in a PR company, and I can I can tell in certain terms that the Democrats are not as good at it. And, I, and by that, I'm a liberal camp all over the world for a whole lot of different reasons. One of them is that, look, right now, they tend to be the better educated electorate. Some people will be offended by that. I'm very sorry. It's just true. Educated well, that's just, a, that's people, just a fact of data. That's not yeah, like look, they, saying I mean, that people are ignorant. Recent Pew, right. Pew study showed right. an absolute correlation between tendency to vote for the right and certainly the populist right and level of education. It's not across the board. In certain countries or certain groups that don't create other types of impact, it scrambles this. But all other things being neutralized from the equation, that is true, that correlation with education. So look, they don't like to oversimplify things. They thus tend to complicate and overcomplicate things. They also like to see all sides of an issue and to make sure their listeners see all sides of an issue. And this puts people to sleep. They think pithy slogans are vulgar and inaccurate. And also, they're so inclined to accept the other and to be empathetic. And I might have showed a little bit of that before myself, that they sometimes seem to lack killer. And of course, they more often refuse to lie. PolitiFact shows this very clearly where the biggest liars are. Hillary Clinton certainly lied on occasion, but not to the level of Trump. Now, lies can be effective, if certainly if they appear in a vacuum. And the Democrats have created a vacuum around things they could message. It is amazing when I tell foreigners that strong American majorities support the Democrats on healthcare, on guns, on climate, on taxation, and on immigration. Actually, a little murkier, but I stand by that. And yet... They can't win elections regularly. The Republicans who oppose the American majority on all these issues are still in the game and not just because of the electoral college advantage. That is because they're more clever in how they message things and they have a killer instinct and they'll lie when necessary. Look, Brexit gives us a very good analogy here. Every single economist in Britain <laughs> said, guys, this is going to... This is going to tank the pound. We're a country that depends on, on, on financial services and trade. And this is no good for us to erect these borders that have come down. And the coming down has been good to us. And we're now like, we're the center of the universe. London was when I lived there in the 2000s. A bad idea. The leave camp was like, bring back control. Get back control from Brussels, from the bureaucrats. That was it. Three words. Three very effective words. They were nonsensical, but they really did work because everyone can get behind that. Bring back control. We got to control our own future. The result is, of course, a few years after Brexit has been implemented, the economy is down versus what it would have been by about 10%. They can't find nurses to staff the NHS. People are waiting long hours, if not days, for an ambulance and weeks for a hospital bed. The pound Russia's is down economic 25%. growth rate. Russia's yeah. economic growth rate this year is projected to be higher than Great Britain's. So, Britain is again a sick ouch. man of Europe, like in the 70s. All the predictions came true. But Michael Gove said back in the day, the people have had enough of experts and this worked. And this is the thing, there is jealousy of these experts. So there's almost a desire sometimes by part of the electorate to, to, to purposely offend the experts. Like if you say two plus two is four, I'm gonna vote five because, not because I don't know it's four, because I dislike you. And this has to do with this very unfortunate, toxic 
and devastating if we don't fix it, clash between the educated classes and the masses. And Brit- well, what you're really talking about is the very Orwellian 1984-esque concept that it's not sufficient to get people to mouth the proposition that two plus two equals five. It's, it's necessary. It's critical to effectuating the mental change that you want in your docile followers is they have to enthusiastically say that. And so if you're Donald Trump and you spout a bunch of garbage about COVID, and I want to be careful here because YouTube's filters here will hear that word and they'll be like, wait a second, are you (laughs) spreading it? No, I'm not. I'm not. If you're Donald Trump and you spread a bunch of garbage about this, then you're not doing it just because you're playing on kind of the culture war in general. It's because people's willingness to say untrue things out of loyalty to you, it's the same thing that cult brainwashing does, right? When you spout Donald Trump's other gigantic lie, which again, I don't want to get into details here, then you're doing that not just because you're trying to protect yourself politically and because you're a pathological narcissist, you're doing it because people's willingness to say untrue things is just core to their to your whole political hold over them. It creates at the top of the show, I suggested that this whole show about Israel's crisis and America's future was there were three buzzwords that I wanted to connect to: laws, lies. And media. Now you are, here you are, you're the media man. (laughs) Let's just for a moment touch on the role of the media here because it is a no holds barred sport in in Israel. It is certainly devolving into that in the US with everything we've learned about Fox News and their intentional lying and gaslighting of America in the big lie spreading that they were doing. What is the role of the media here in this democratic? disintegration that we're seeing both in Israel and the U.S. I actually have recently written that media needs to start calling a spade, like the both sidesism that the basically enables what about it. it isn't all that helpful. And I think people are attracted to not just opinion, but analysis. The question is how to do that analysis and how to connect the dots and how to provide the people, the readership or listenership or audience in general with contextualized understanding what's going on without appearing to be political is very dangerous when the facts themselves and the truth itself has become a political position. It's tough. And my view was, with all due respect, the media's need to be objective. Objective doesn't always have to mean neutral, okay? You talked about complexity before. It reminds me of the famous, for every complicated problem, there's an answer that's clear, simple, and wrong. And just a very recent example, the whole kerfuffle over gas stoves. Back in January, there was this little thing where where there was a commissioner on the Consumer Product Safety Commission who said, we we might have to ban gas stoves. And Fox News had what might gently be called a mediagasm. They were like, yes, (laughs) this is our moment. And they went, they took it up to 11. They went crazy. And they said, see, jackbooted government thugs are going to show up and rip the gas stove out of your house, which was never, of course, true. And the White House immediately said, hey, this commissioner doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. Not get, not, we're so just talking allow about that. that. Yeah, like we <laughs> might increase environmental or efficiency regulations on future gas stoves. We might do that. And they recently announced, yeah, I think we're going to do that. When you go back and you look at the reporting on it, the Fox News reporting is clear and simple and wrong. It's Biden administration. What do you do when there's a market for that? Because this leads us to to my main question. I wish I had an epiphany. All I have is a question. What to do when the free market encourages nonsense and vulgarity? We're all loyal capitalists, but let me tell you something. In Israel, as in Italy and in other countries that have had both a public broadcaster and a whole bunch of private broadcasters, the, pri- the privately run TV stations that have news are gradually becoming Fox-like entertainment. Left, center, doesn't matter. It's not particularly credible, and it's viewed through the prism of it's just either entertainment or, or, in fact, politics. And the public broadcaster that's governed by journalistic imperatives, regardless of the ratings that generates, ends up being the most 
journalistically legitimate source of news in Israel and in Britain, the BBC. Look, man, this, we is, lack my that problem. In America. this is my exact problem. I strive very hard, even though I'm a center left political person myself, I strive very hard to bring insight, nuance, experts who really know what the hell they're talking about, like you, onto this show. And I don't just confine myself to liberals and to sure, Democratic Party viewpoints. And if one side is wrong, let them try to prove their case and fail. No and reason I'm not. not That's exactly, exactly. Now, I'm not saying that I'm the best. I know I'll be Trumpian about this for a second. This is the best show that you can get on YouTube <laughs> or podcast. I strive for that. Even if I don't always achieve it, I'm trying to be a Michelin one-star restaurant next to the McDonald's. What happens? People go to McDonald's and I understand that. It's delicious, even if it'll give you intestinal distress later on. And Possibly the people that go to you have a higher value as targets of advertising. I, That's a yes. saving grace. Our advertisers recently on this show have been Coca-Cola, DraftKings. <laughs> oh, there you go. Moving up in the world. Look, I want to go no, about- I actually I have a, I want to react to that because here's the go, thing. Go, go. I would like there to be like a huge audience for, let's say, The Economist, The New York Times, and your podcast, rather than some of the others I won't name. The only way to have that happen is through education, okay? Now, most democratic societies have democratically decided to underpay their public school teachers, to not pay what's needed to bring the most excellent, the best and the brightest to teaching. Some still go there and they're heroes, but by and large, that is a dynamic that is, what does that mean? That means that we have essentially sold our future down the river and the and mortgaged it essentially for for short term gain. Consequently, you're going to have a, a, an undereducated electorate that's going to be very vulnerable to gaslighting and propaganda and populism. And it's an own goal, as they say in the UK, and it's richly deserved. And it if absolutely. I had one policy I would change, it would be this, invest in education. Let me loop that back to your question before, which is, what do you do about it? And look, if we go by the principle that for every complicated problem, there's an answer that's simple and clear and wrong, I think if I were to give a simple, clear answer, it would probably be wrong. There's not one solution. I do think it's a, this isn't satisfying. It isn't satisfying. What do you do about this media problem? I think there's probably like six or seven things you have to do. I think well, one of the how solutions- the liberals you... should, should maybe show some courage for once and call out the lies more convincingly and with high- I think that is one thing. So one thing we should do is what I call the My Cousin Vinny defense. If you remember the movie, My Cousin Vinny, he sure, falls asleep during the prosecution's opening statement. He wakes up, he stands up, he has no idea what's going on. And Joe Pesci just says, everything that guy just said is bullshit. So that's the first thing. The well, Democrats one time I want to hear that from a Democrat or from an Israeli liberal. You, can't, you can't believe how bad it is. The populist right in Israel, as it tries to prosecute its civil reform, has a bunch of slogans. And they're about as correct as the Brexit slogans in the UK. One of them was, the judges appoint themselves. One friend brings a friend and they appoint each other. Judges appoint each other. Now, this isn't true. There's a complex judicial appointments committee where the judges cannot appoint each other at all. They are three out of nine. I've rarely heard this called bullshit by the other side. They just hear the lies, they groan. Some of them quietly say, oh my God, the people who believe this are so stupid. And they don't really convincingly refute it. And I see these things and I'm astonished, honestly. Look, and as much as fact-checking doesn't work, we've seen that as a kid, because a lie makes it halfway around the world over to you from where I am before the truth has a chance to put its pants on, it's still necessary. It's not sufficient. But it's necessary. TikTok videos refuting the lies in convincing fashion. Just cutting, of, just cutting right through. Which with we a lot try of bass and drums as well. Yeah, yeah, especially on Blue Amp. We try and do that. But look, I think there are other things we probably need. If the Fox News defamation lawsuit has shown something, it's that Section 230 reform holding social media companies accountable for some of the lies. And like I was about to say Romulan. I meant Romanian <laughs> generated bots. Look, maybe the Romulans are after us too. The <laughs> Romanian bot farms, they're coming after our democracy on, on, on Facebook. Yeah, Facebook, you should be responsible for that, legally responsible, and they will shut it down, but quick, holding media companies, traditional media companies like Fox. How, how would you answer the charge that this turns Facebook into a highly centralized and unaccountable censor? Because they are running a monopoly over a certain niche product. Uh, look, my my position would be, that we should assault 
Facebook with every tool in our legal arsenal because it's evil. It is a real-time psychological experiment conducted on the worldwide human populace that is not prepared for it. And we're seeing the bad outcomes. Thank you, Francis Haugen, Facebook whistleblower. We're seeing what it's doing, especially to our teen girls. And why do we allow them? We, we don't allow tobacco companies to lie about the effects of their products. Why should we allow Facebook and Twitter to do the same? Because Facebook isn't lying. directly lying in the sense that it's their users who are lying and they're not interfering. The, the issue of whether a social media is a publisher is complicated. So yeah, I, Section 230 reform is probably needed and AI can actually help in this regard, but it's not a simple thing, frankly. No, it's not. You want Elon Musk to censor Twitter and have it be his decision? Who's lying? Who's not lying? No, none of this is simple. And maybe this is a good, maybe this is a good way to tie up the conversation. Look, none of this is easy. None of the issues that Israel is confronting are easy to deal with. They're complex in the U.S. as well. And as you've demonstrated brilliantly, they're tied together with global forces that there's not going to be a, aha, press this button, answer to. I will look, we've gotten caught up in this on the Blue Amp channel ourselves. We put out an episode that was featured, undercover reporting, video of John Eastman propagating his lies and we got caught up by an algorithmic filter on YouTube that said, uh-oh, wow. you're spreading, and we were taken down for a week. Now, YouTube did a great job. We appealed. We worked with them. They figured it out. A human looked at it. They're like, oh, no, wait, you're debunking. You're contextualizing. You're not spreading. But this stuff, it went to show, that wow. whole episode, that this is unbelievably hard. But just because a problem is hard doesn't mean that it's totally intractable, and it doesn't mean that you shouldn't be laboring away at it. And so I, I, just to bring things to what I hope is a hopeful note, many people, including me, were really downright petrified of what was going to happen in 2020 in the U.S. and even in 2022. Things came out better than we feared, in large part because people, normal people, rose up on mass to reject the crazy and the extreme. The center held. That's the center held. And yeah. that is what we're seeing, I hope, I think, in Israel today. That's be. what I'm hearing yeah. from you. It really may be. Look, obviously our hope is that the center holds. All these stratagems that we've been discussing is are all in, in aid of that outcome. And even though it's complicated, and I think you and I and a million others don't necessarily have all the solutions, you have to, you know, the first step is to recognize the problem. The problem is we have a global epidemic, at least in the West, in Westernized countries and Western countries, of bad karma in, in, in politics and, and politics overtaking people's lives. And this is not a bad karma that I remember from my parents' generation. Something terrible has happened in the past 30, 40 years. I connected to tech disruption and globalization and some bad faith players in, on, on a political scene globally and in various key nations. But it, it clearly is the case. So I think we have to just understand that is so, do what we can to mitigate it, and we're needed, not be afraid to fight. Dan Perry, an on-the-ground observer of the really consequential forces that are shaping democracies and societies around the world. Really appreciate you coming to us. I know we literally have to get you out of here because you have to go do your job there on the ground and events are just unfolding like at a breakneck pace. So thank you for taking some time out to be with us. And I hope everyone checks out your Substack. Thank you, Matt. Pleasure to be with you.